Good morning, everyone. It's a blessing to be able to be with you here this morning that we can again open up a portion of God's Word and study from it. If you would this morning, turn over to Isaiah chapter 5 with me, if you would. Isaiah chapter 5 is where we're, going to be, where we're going to be taking the beginning text of our lesson this morning, looking at a question that God posed there in Isaiah chapter 5 and talking about that, about what God has done for us and what more could He do for us. Beginning in Isaiah chapter 5, let's look at what God has done for us, and God breaks it down here, beginning in verse 1. Now let me sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved regarding his vineyard. My well-beloved has a vineyard on a very fruitful hill. He has dug it up. He has cleared out its stones. He has planted with it the choicest vine. He has built a tower in its midst. He has also made a wine press in it. So he expected it to bring forth good grapes, but it brought forth wild grapes. Isaiah starts breaking down here the blessings that God has given to Israel. Here are the wonderful things that he has given us, and he breaks it down in this analogy of God building this vineyard. Here is this fertile hill. Here is this wonderful plot of land that is perfect. God looked for it. God found it. And then he has set the foundation. He's gone in. He's removed the stones. He's tilled up the land. He's found this not only wonderful piece of land, but he has built it up to be something even better. Look at all the work he has laid for the foundation so that we can come in. Look, he has not only prepared this ground, but then he found the best plants to put in it. He's found, he says, the choicest vines to plant that will yield forth these wonderful grapes and blessings. He has set up this watchtower. He set up a fence. Here it is. I've dealt with the dangers inside. I've dealt with the problems. I've dealt with the weeds. I've dealt with any kind of varmints that can get in and ruin anything. And I've set up this watchtower so I can look out to anything that might be approaching. No other danger, no other animals. I'm keeping a constant watch so that danger will not be able to get us unsurprised and we can be prepared. Look, I've already done the heavy lifting. I've set everything up to prepare for the harvest. In a lot of ways, paralleling what God has done for them with the promised land and with Canaan. I have given you homes that you did not have to build. I have given you vineyards that you did not have to plant. I have set up walls that you did not have to erect. I have given you a land flowing with milk and honey. This is how Isaiah is describing what God has done for the Israelites. Here are the abundant blessings that he has given us. And in many ways, parallels to the New Testament church. Here are the wonderful blessings that God has given us. Yet unfortunately, there in verse 2, it wraps it up saying, yet it is yielded and it has brought forth wild grapes. Something that is bitter something that I did not plant. Something else has still wormed its way in and it's corrupted everything that I've tried to build up and everything I've blessed you with. You go on a little bit further down there in Isaiah chapter 5 and we can read a little bit further down beginning in verse 3. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge please between me and my vineyard. What more could have been done to my vineyard that I have not done in it? Why then, when I expected it to bring forth good grapes, did it bring forth wild grapes? The question there God is asking is, what more could I have done? This pattern started with, really, Adam and Eve. Here's the Garden of Eden that I have given you. Here's every tree, everything that is good to eat in the garden. Here's every blessing you are forever taken care of. And sin found its way in when Satan tempted Adam and Eve. Israel, here is this promised land that I have given you. Everything that you could need, I have promised you, as we're going to continue reading in the book of Deuteronomy on Sunday morning, every blessing that I will continue to give you if you will be faithful. And sin keeps arising. God asks again, what more could I have done? Was there something lacking here that I didn't do? And then we have to ask the same question today. 
Is there something lacking in the church? Is there something lacking in his word that God has failed to do that has allowed sin, that has allowed temptation to come in or made us decide, no, I don't want to be a part of this vineyard. I don't want to be a part of his church. I don't want the blessings he has given me. Someone else has done more and given us so much more. Let's look at that and draw some parallels there. Job chapter 12, Job recounts there that God is the one who makes nations great. He brings kings up. He allows nations to rise and be blessed, as well as he's also the one to destroy them. He is the one that enlarges them, and he is the one that leads them away. It's happened with many nations that God has gone in. He has blessed them. They have followed him. They have obeyed him. They have done everything they could to follow him, and then something gets in the way. Something comes in and people start turning aside. People start allowing sin to creep in bit by bit into a household, into a church, into a nation. And it starts to fall apart. It's not on a failing on his part. He cultivated a wonderful home. He has given us a wonderful, blessed church to be a part of. It has everything we could need in it. It's not a failing on his part that some don't want to be a part of it or some want to leave it. He's done everything he can. He's looked and he understands our needs better than we do. And has gone and said, look, not only in this vineyard for the Israelites, but for my church, what do they need? Let me make sure that I understand what they need and I supply it. Jesus talked about this when he was talking about this coming church. In Matthew chapter 6, it's part of his Sermon on the Mount. Pick up there with me in Matthew chapter 6, beginning in verse 25. Therefore, Jesus says, I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body or what you will put on. Is not life more than food and body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Oftentimes we focus on the latter half of some of those verses talking about the need to not worry. But there's an important thing I think that's in the beginning of those verses that we sometimes overlook and that God says, listen, I understand what you need. And if you have any doubt that I will give you and I will supply what you need, look at nature around you. The flowers and grass of the field, the birds of the air, the foxes in their holes, everything has everything they need to thrive. And man was made in God's image. How much better blessings will God give those who are made in His image, who He sent His Son to die for, than grass that is here and dies tomorrow? Than birds and foxes that live a few years and then just become more nutrients for the soil? God says, look, and I've given you everything that you need. Paul recognizes Philippians 4 and verse 19. My God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory and in Jesus Christ. There's no doubt that the same kind of message from Isaiah is those that have been repeated by Christ, by Paul, and by so many others, that God has abundantly blessed us. Even more so, not just in the physical things, but in the spiritual things. That we have the best kind of seed. We have his gospel that we can go and what it grows into and what it can cultivate in the hearts of men is far better than grapes. Here are the things that pertain to life and godliness. As you notice, it says in 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1, picking up there in verse 3 as His divine power has given us all things that pertain to life, there's that grass, there's that birds in the air, there's the things that we do need, here's the clothing, here's the food, here's the shelter that we do need. God recognizes this. He has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who called us by glory and virtue, by which having been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, 
having escaped the corruption that is in the world through us. We talk about how great the promises are from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that God repeated. Here's this great nation that is going to come out of you. And even as we read this morning in Deuteronomy chapter 1, that your people number as the stars in heaven. Here's this land that the Israelites are about to go into in our Sunday morning study that Moses is preparing them for. This land flowing with milk and honey. The seed that Christ would come through that lineage. We talk about how great those promises are. And yet again, Peter reminds us, God has given us great and precious promises and we get to reap the benefits of all this. Here's the foundation that he has laid for his church. For thousands of years, all the way back to Genesis chapter 3, when he told Adam and Eve, there's going to be seed coming through you that is going to crush Satan's head. All the foundation work that had to be built up there so that we can be a part of his church, so that we can have forgiveness of our sins, so that we have God's word that we have easy access to that we can all sit down and read and study and reap the benefits of. God says, here are these wonderful blessings that I have given you so freely that I want you to take advantage of. Again, in 2 Corinthians chapter 9 there in verse 10, Now may he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food supply and multiply the seed which you have sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness. Paul doesn't just want us to take advantage of the physical blessings that God gives us without taking advantage of the spiritual. We can take advantage of the physical blessings this afternoon when I finally quit talking and you get to go to lunch. And you get to go home and go to your homes. Enjoy the AC and rest or do some yard work or whatever you decide to do. Yes, we get to enjoy the physical blessings, but even more so, we get to enjoy the spiritual blessings. And Christ and Jesus and Peter are begging us, take advantage of that. Don't just focus on the physical blessings increasing. Focus on increasing righteousness. Get to work. Here he has given us, as Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3, Christ has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. He's given us His Word. He's given us these blessings. Go and use it. Don't let it sit there and rot. Recognize that we need to get to work, but that God is still protecting us. Isaiah described this watchtower and these walls that he built around the vineyard to protect it in the same way that God has gone to great lengths and is still going to great lengths to make sure that we are protected. That doesn't mean that we're immune from danger or we'll never face danger or we'll never face temptation. That's not what that means. But rather, look over in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, beginning there in verse 1. Finally, brethren, Paul writes to the Thessalonians, pray for us that the word of the Lord may run swiftly and be glorified, just as it is with you, that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men, for not all have faith. But the Lord is faithful who will establish you and guard you from the evil one. That's what that watchtower means. It is an active duty. If you just place up a watchtower and no one ever sits in it, is your vineyard guarded? No, you just have a really tall building that's not being taken advantage of, and thieves can come in, animals can come in, and they can do whatever they want to the vineyard. God didn't just establish his church and then abandon us. He is still actively working to guard us, to help us in prayer through the men that we might face that might try to seek corruption and even harm towards us. That's why Paul says, pray for us, that we may be delivered even from wicked and unreasonable men. But even more so from just men, he's saying pray for us that we may be delivered from the evil one. And he's talking about Satan there as well. That God has an active role in putting limits on what Satan is allowed to do to us. 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 13 is probably a passage that most of you are familiar with. 
God is faithful. God understands what we can and cannot bear, and he will not allow us to be tempted beyond what we are able to bear. He's constantly watching and making sure that Satan is not putting more on us that we can deal with and that we can overcome. He will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with temptation will also make a way of escape that you will be able to bear it. God is constantly on the watch making sure His church, His people, will be protected. That they can overcome the dangers within and without. And with all the groundwork that He's laid in place, His simple request is that we work for Him. He's already done the hard part. He's already laid the foundation. He's already planted the seed. He's already given us all the supplies that we need. No, what He calls for us to do is simply to go out and spread it. Over in Matthew chapter 13, if you'll turn over there with me, if you will. Matthew chapter 13, pick up there with me in verse 3. Then Jesus spoke many things to them in the parables, saying, Behold, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and birds came out and devoured them. Some fell on the stony places where they did not have much earth, and they immediately sprang up because they had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. Some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up and choked them. But others fell on good ground and yielded a crop, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Jesus is saying, here is all the work that I have laid the foundation for. Go and take the same blessings. Go and take the same word by which you listened and obeyed and were saved and go and spread it among the world. And then still, I'm going to be doing the heavy lifting. You're not the one saving anybody. That's Christ. Yes, I try my best to convince people, but it's not my power and it's not my speaking skills that are the one that change the hearts of men. That lies in this book right here. I just try to do my best to present it and make it understandable. But even if I just gave somebody this, they can pretty easily figure it out on their own and come to a reading and understanding of what God wants them to do, of the blessings that he has put forward and the access and the ease in which we can gain access to these things. It's nothing special that I'm doing that prepares that. No, he said, here's the seed, go out, put it to good use, and then it's up to the hearts of men and how they respond, what happens. Going over to Matthew chapter 11 there, beginning in verse 29, Jesus says, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. That doesn't mean there's no work to do. That means, no, take the yoke upon you. There is work that I require you to do to be a part of this kingdom, to be in this vineyard, to get access to these blessings. But that work is what? grand scheme of things, it's pretty easy and it's pretty light. Because he's doing the heavy lifting. He's the one doing 99% of the work here. Not only has done, but continues to do. He says, what I call you to do is go out and just continue spreading the message. Go out and continue to sow the seed. Here are the abundant blessings that I can give you. Now the question is, do you want to keep it? Even when it comes to, when we often think of planting seeds and setting up a vineyard or setting up a field. Okay, the planting is one thing and you got to maintain it. And then come fall, now you got the harvest. That's a whole other level of work that has to be done. But even there, Jesus says, I'm taking care of that too. Matthew chapter 13, go a little bit further down from that parable of the sower. Matthew 13, begin there in verse 27 there with me, if you will. 
Matthew 20, or I'm sorry, Matthew 13, beginning in verse 27, reads, So the servants of the owner came to him and said, Sir, did you not sow good seed in the field? How then does it have tares? He said to them, An enemy has done this. The servants said to him, Do you want us to go in then and gather them up? But he said, No, lest while you gather them to get, I'm sorry, lest while you gather up the tares, you also uproot the root wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest, and at the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, first gather the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barns. Just said, listen, you're going to go out and you're going to sow the seed, and there's going to be other people that are going out there and are trying to spread something else. They're out there trying to convince the world, as hard or harder than his followers are, that their way is better that their vineyard has better blessings, that their way of life is much less restrictive, it's much easier, it's much more freeing to do what Satan does, to do what some other religion does, to follow anything else other than God, his blessings, and the home that he has set up for us. They're out there trying to sow every other kind of false information and every lie and everything else that they can. And Christ says, I know that they're out there. I know that they're spreading that seed. But I'm also confident enough in my people and my followers that they can still grow up healthy. I'm confident that my word is powerful enough and my blessings speak enough for themselves that they'll still be able to flourish. We'll take care of the rest of it later. We'll see what gets choked out because the word is so strong and in the areas where the tares and sin become so powerful it starts to overtake everything else. Eventually the time is coming when all that gets wiped away. Don't worry, I'll be able to distinguish between the righteous and the unrighteous. Don't worry, I'll be able to distinguish between the wheat and the tares and the weeds. I'll know what we want to keep and what we want to throw out. A little bit further down in that same chapter of Matthew 13, this time pick up in verse 37. He answered and said to him, He who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the word. And the good seed are the sons of the kingdom, but the tares are the sons of the wicked one. The enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are the angels. Therefore, as the tares are gathered and burned with fire, so will it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out his angels. They will gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, those who practice lawlessness, and he will cast them into the furnace of fire, and there will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. And the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears to hear, let him hear even still at the end of it all. God says, I will take care of my people. I'll be able to distinguish them between the lies and the unrighteousness and even those who pretend to be my followers. I'll be able to distinguish and separate the two. And whoever thought that Satan had better blessings or he had a better home or he had a better way of living, they're going to learn very quickly that they chose the wrong path. It's your job to go out there and try and convince them otherwise as long as you're alive. Let my word do the work. Let my word be the power that can convince people. And don't you fall astray either. Because his kingdom is right there. The blessings are still there that we can get access to. Question that I think God has asked on multiple occasions, not just in Isaiah 5. What more could I have done? You look back to Adam and Eve, we have a really hard time picturing what the Garden of Eden would look like. Because all we've known is the aftermath of that. A world in which sickness and pain and suffering and sin has always existed to us. It's hard for me to imagine what a world without those things would look like in a lot of ways. 
But I do know this, God didn't leave anything out that Adam and Eve needed. He gave them everything. They still had work to do. They still tended and cared to the garden. But he gave them everything they could possibly need. There's been no question, I think, for those of you that have been a part of those Sunday morning studies, as we've gone through Exodus, Numbers, Leviticus, and now Deuteronomy, we've come to a pretty obvious conclusion. Listen, God has promised everything to the Israelites, and when they're righteous... No one can stand against them. Nothing can compare to the blessings and the riches that they have access to. And many times the question has come up in those classes just absolutely stunned. Why are the Israelites, not just once, but over and over and over again, saying they don't want God? They don't want his riches. They don't want his blessings. They don't want this home that he has prepared for them. They don't want this land flowing with milk and honey. They'd rather go back to slavery in Egypt because that sounds easier. It's amazing there. That that pattern doesn't just keep going until Joshua and the people take over Canaan. It keeps going up until Isaiah's day hundreds of years later. That finally they're about to be taken into captivity. It's leading into the question that Isaiah poses in Isaiah 3. O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge now between me and my vineyard. What more could have been done in my vineyard that I have not done in it? Where did I fail? Where did I lack in giving you not only everything that I promised, but so much more? And no one could answer Isaiah, and in turn, no one could answer God who was speaking through Isaiah. He had given them everything. In many ways, the same question is still being posed to us today. Here's the church of which Christ is the cornerstone of that foundation. He is the word in which it has been built upon. Here are the numerous bountiful blessings that you and I have access to. Here is the redemption of our sin. Here is a promise of an even greater home soon coming where we can be in God's presence for all of eternity. Are you challenging God and saying, nope, you're not giving me enough? I certainly hope not. I hope that nothing is standing in your way of wanting to be a part of His kingdom and the blessings that He has to give us. I want you to be able to give the answer when your life comes to an end. I want to be able to give the answer when my life comes to an end that I look with excitement and joy not just at what God has given me in the past but at a greater blessing that I know is coming in the future like Paul did. As Paul knew he was nearing the end of his life, he said, I have fought the fight. I'm sorry, I fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day. Not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. He knows his life is very soon going to come to an end. And based upon the vineyard, based upon the church, based upon the promises and the blessings that he was given by God, by Christ, by his word, and how he has seen them fulfilled in his own life, in the blessings that he has been able to partake in, he knows with all surety and faith that the promise that he has not yet gotten to see, that home with God in heaven will come.
Paul says, I can't wait to get there. There's nothing else God could have done to convince me. There's nothing else that God can do to incentivize me. I want to be there. And even still, until his dying bread, until his dying day, Paul says, as long as I'm still on this earth, as long as I can still be of use, I'll keep doing whatever I can for God. Look at some of his last closing thoughts that we have written down in God's Word. These are some of the final things historically that Paul wrote. Continuing on in verse 9 of 2 Timothy chapter 4, Paul writes, Be diligent to come to me quickly, for Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world, and has departed for Thessalonica. Cretans for Galatia, Titus for Dalmatia, only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you, for he is useful to me and for my ministry. And Tychicus, which I have sent to Ephesus, bring the cloak which I left in Carpus and Troas when you come, and the books and especially the parchments. What is Paul asking Timothy to do? Is it come and see him because he just misses him and I want to see you before I die? That may be part of it. But what's he asking Timothy to do? What's he asking him to bring? Bring me more books. Bring me more parchment. Bring me more people. Some of the workers that were here with me because I'm still working even as I'm facing death one of them has forsaken me. Many of them I've sent out and they're out working elsewhere and it's just me and Luke right now. So do your best to come with me, to me quickly. Bring more parchment, bring more books, bring more work. I'm going to keep going until Caesar says, nope, your life is over. I know it's coming soon, so I'm going to try and get as much in as I can. I will not go down. I will finish the fight. I will run the race until my last day. Because God, who has done everything for me, who has given me so many blessings, there is no possible way I can repay Him. But Paul says, I want to give Him as much as I can before my time is up. There's always more we could do as well. There's always more work that we can do. There's always ways in which we can improve. Paul understood that. But even more so, he understood the blessings of which God had given him, and he wanted to work until his last moments. Because soon, all of our time will end. The harvest will come. The world will come to an end or you and I will no longer be upon this earth because we pass away. Hopefully that's how we go. I hope that God doesn't look upon us the same way that he looked upon Israel back in Isaiah chapter 5. Turn with me back there one more time and the lesson is yours. And Isaiah 5, picking up there in verse 5, after God posed the question, what more could I have done? What else could I have done for Israel? I planted grapes and it's brought forth wild, or some verses say sour grapes. What more could I have done? Now in verse 5, now please tell me, I'm sorry, now please let me tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will take away its hedge and it shall be burned. I will break down its wall and it shall be trampled down. I will lay it to waste. It shall not be pruned or dug, and there shall come up briars and thorns. I will also command the clouds that they may no longer rain on it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel. The men of Judah are his pleasant plant. He looked for justice, but behold, oppression. For righteousness, but behold, a cry for help. I hope that he doesn't look upon the church at Talmadge in the same way. Today or at some point in the future. I hope that he looks upon me 
as someone who is striving his best to run the course, to finish the race, to serve him faithfully. So that when the harvest comes, as he described in Matthew 13, when judgment day comes, that I be regarded as a good and faithful servant and I get to go home. This is a reminder for me and I hope it's a reminder for you of the number of blessings that God has given us. That there is still work to do as long as this earth still stands, as long as we have another day. And that we need to remain faithful because it doesn't take long to end up like Israel and Judah here. That we take for granted the blessings that God gives us. That we lose sight of him and we allow Satan to come into our lives and lead us astray. He's remaining watchful and he's continuing to give us blessings. Let us continue to do the same. If you are not a part of this vineyard, you are not a part of this kingdom, you don't have access to these blessings, to this forgiveness of sin, to this avenue of prayer, to this comfort and peace and joy that can be found in his kingdom. I'm not asking what more can I do, what more can God do to convince you to be a part of this kingdom? He's already sent his son to die for you. He's given you an avenue of forgiveness of your sins. He's given you his words so that you can know his mind and his will and his love for you. Of the blessings that you have awaiting you, that he wants you to be a part of his church. That he wants you to be with him in heaven for all of eternity. If you are not a part of his kingdom, then you need to make that decision today to do so. To follow after him and to obey him. To be washed in baptism this morning. To have your sins washed away and start your work in his kingdom. In following him, in growing in righteousness, and in serving him faithfully. If that is a case for you this morning, as we stand and sing the song here in just a moment, please come forward and let's make those things right. If you are a Christian this morning and you maybe mirror the Jews there in verse 5 to 7 and you've lost sight of those blessings, you've allowed Satan to come in and sow the tares and thorns and thistles and choke out your love and distract you from the blessings that God has given you, you have allowed sin into your life, do not let this hour pass without correcting that. Either by praying to him and asking for forgiveness, or by coming forward this morning and asking for the prayers of the saints and asking for forgiveness of God, of sin that has brought shame upon his name. Whatever the case may be this morning, I hope that you be invigorated and you be challenged that we continue to ask the question, what more could God do for us? And understand the answer is nothing because he has given us everything that we could ever need. If there's a reason for you to come forward this morning, please do so now as together we stand and sing the song that has been selected.